Hey, um, I wanted to do a bunch of videos on the topic of using scales and arpeggios in order to uh, create music. Now, I'm just going to do this off the top of my head, so uh, it's not too contrived. Um, I'm just going to like spew a bunch of stuff out and hopefully I'll say something that's going to be useful. So, to start with, you often get advised to practice scales and arpeggios um, when you're studying music. And, you know, it's, they say it's good for technique and it's, it's just something you need to do. So, yeah, it's, it's broadly true, but uh, it doesn't necessarily guarantee that you get particularly good at uh, improvising, just running up and down the scale and arpeggio. It's got its limits because um, you know when you do a scale uh, like this one, that's a A minor pentatonic. In uh, ascending order, that's two octaves. So, okay, well I get good at I do that a lot. Okay, well that's great. So, the thing is, uh, all that really teaches me is how to be good at doing this. Okay, so uh, without, if that's the only thing that you do, then uh, you haven't really got the key to unlock the scale or, or apply it. Um, whilst, you know, it's good for technique, the technique of doing this. <laughs> it doesn't help you play stuff, it doesn't help you compose or create particularly. So, how is a scale used to compose or improvise? That's the question that you need to ask yourself. Well, there's, there's two ways to consider. Um, one, you change the order of the notes and two, you change the number of notes. Um, and there's a third one, which is the articulation. So let me demonstrate what I mean. So change the order of the notes. Okay, so rather than going... I might do something like this. I'm still pulling from the main pool of notes, but uh, they're in a different order. Now I could also change the uh, the number of notes. There I played three for each. But I could I could do something like play the first note in the scale twice, then the second note once, then the third note twice, then once, then the fourth note once. A little bit different. Okay. Uh, the l next thing I mentioned was changing the articulation. So you can play notes long or short. So I might do a long short scheme. way, very important, is, is the rhythm. Rather than playing, for instance, a steady stream of eighth notes, I might play a swung series of eighth notes, a series of swung eighth notes. Or I might do uh, dotted uh, dotted eighth note followed by a sixteenth note. Uh, and there's also the, the fifth consideration, which is what chords that you put uh, you put your 
scale over. You know, there's a difference between um, putting this scale da, 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 over an A major chord as opposed to an F sharp major chord. I'll, uh, I'll pull some backing tracks up in um, future videos to demonstrate that a bit better. I'm, uh, I'm, not, I'm not singing the pitches properly, but... Um... So, those are the, the kinds of things that um, you apply to the basic scale or the basic arpeggio. Um, or combinations of the two. I mean, you can consider this this scale uh, an A minor pentatonic. It's really a combination of scale and arpeggio. Um, it's, it's basically you could consider it this a minor seven arpeggio. That would cover four of the notes: A, C, E, and G. That's two octaves. And there's one extra note which is D. Five notes per octave. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. So it's a combination of scale and arpeggio. And, and at most good phrases combine scales um, which are usually characterized by moving in seconds. Uh, if we're talking like uh, a minor scale. Oops. It moves in major and minor seconds, whereas an arpeggio tends to move in thirds with the occasional second. Third, 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 second, third, 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 second. Uh, so most good melodies, you want a mixture of seconds and thirds and other other intervals, um, mainly seconds. But you know, you want occasional melodic leaps. So that, that, that's why the the major minor pentatonic is so uh, fruitful for coming up with with phrases out straight out the box. Um, you, know, you play them as they are, and it sounds pretty cool. Especially if you put a passing note to make it a, a blues scale. So, the thing is, um, it's probably best to uh, approach this, this problem from two ends. So, at the one end, you you, you dedicate some time to scale practice and when you practice the scales you uh, apply a variety of variations along the lines that I um, described before. That is to say you put the notes in different orders, you, uh, you apply different rhythms and you try different articulations. And what comes out is still going to be somewhat like a scale but it's going to be freer and more interesting. And the other end to come at it from is to learn licks. So you might learn a number of licks for each type of scale and you'd want to learn those licks in the five different positions because um, you can play each scale in five different positions as you probably know. According to the K system is the E type shape, the D type shape. C 
type shape. The A type shape. And finally, uh, the G type shape. So you want to learn licks in all of these shapes. Um, so if you know, say I know five or ten licks that in, in each of those uh, those patterns, then if ever I want to play, um, you know, over one of the chords which the scale fits, and that's something else that you have to learn. It's easy for me to do, and uh, learn the skill of adjusting uh, the rhythm of the lick and the phrasing of the lick just to suit the feel. Um, you know, so I might learn a lick like this. Well, that is a, it's pretty much a straight scale. A straight A minor or A blue scale. Seven, uh, eighth note, triplet notes. But um, you could change the rhythm slightly there. Another variation. I've noticed uh, it might not be coming across too well, but I'm tapping my foot there. So I'm setting up a beat that I'm playing in relation to. And a lot of music is the content is significant from the relationships uh, between one thing, one uh, part, and another part. So I'm setting I'm uh, So for instance, um, displacement, rhythmic displacement. Um, which means playing, starting your phrase, on, playing the same rhythm but starting the phrase on different beats. You know, if I start on the one, one, two, three, four, that's not quite the same as if I start on the and of one. Okay. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, one. Two, three, four, one. So there, I took the same phrase, the same rhythm, but I started it on the and of one. And it would be a little bit different uh, if you start on the two, the and of two, the three, the and of three, the four, the and of four. So what it basically means is a whole range of transformations that you can put any phrase through um, and it's things like this that have been applied to any kind of melodic sequence uh, because a scale and a lick are, and an arpeggio what they've got in common is they are melodic sequences of notes that you can apply different rhythms to you can put start them on different beats you can apply different uh, uh, articulations to them you can put them against different chords, and you can change the note order. So they're the, raw, they're the raw materials, but you can do all kinds of things. So what's really important is knowing how to do all these kinds of things to build up your own vocabulary and repertoire of licks. And that is how you learn how to compose, in whatever sense, you know, from writing riffs to writing symphonies, to improvise, which is pretty much spontaneous composition, uh, often relying on pre-formulated uh, you know, material. So, hope that makes uh, a little bit of sense to you to start with. Um, have a mess around with the ideas and I'll throw out some other ideas as they come, uh, come to me. Alright, good luck. Take it easy.